and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Today we have a very special guest that we had the pleasure of meeting in person a few months ago, and Alan and I have both graced his podcast. He's a speaker, an executive coach, the founder of the Emory Leadership Group, and the host of the Lead Like No Other podcast. He is also a leadership expert. We are sitting down with Patrick Verano. What is happening, my friend? Hello, boys. You guys are awesome. Uh, I have been looking forward to this for over a week now, and uh, thanks for having me on. So hopefully I can bring some value to your to your audience. I'm sure you will. So like I said, Alan and I, for the listeners, we have been lucky enough to be on the Lead Like No Other <laughs> podcast, and it was one of the best shows I've been on in terms of just Patrick knows his stuff. Yeah. Not just in leadership, but in personal development. It's something that he's been into a, for a long time. So my, my, in, my initial intention was to dive into your story, Patrick. And again, everybody sees the polished product. They see the speaker. They see the podcast host. They see the executive coach. But where did this all start for you, and how did you become Patrick V of today? Uh, that's a great question. And Alan, actually, you and I had this question at dinner. You had asked me how long I'd been in personal development. Yes, I told Kevin that earlier today. Yeah, keep going. I I said it really had been, like it it resonates exactly. I know exactly where I was when it happened too. I was down in South Carolina and I was at a gas station literally. And I was down there on spring break and my mother had passed away that previous year uh, to breast cancer. So I was kind of in a, I wasn't in a great place. And the group that I was hanging out with, we were doing a lot of drinking, a lot of partying. And when I was down there, literally, we pulled into a gas station. And here we are, 18 years old, and we're driving down in South Carolina. We're in Hilton Head, getting ready to go to the beach. We pull into a gas station, and there's a a guy pumping his car next to us. And he starts talking to me about Zig Ziglar Mm -hmm. and see you at the top. And how he thinks it's a book that really I should read and and uh, talking about how impactful that has been on his life. And I'm thinking, never in my life has it ever happened again that somebody stops me at a gas station pumping gas telling me about a motivational book I should I should read. <laughs> I have that book is on that my crazy? bookshelf right across it the is, way over there. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was the first moment that I entered that space and uh, I just... It was voracious from there. Patrick, I couldn't get enough of it. What made you, like, what was the deciding fact? Like, obviously, this person said you should read this, but what were the thoughts in your head, and what what connected in order for you to say, like, you know what, I'm actually going to commit to to reading this? Because I was struggling. I was unhappy. I was I was drinking so much, and a lot of that was to bury um, a lot of my own unhappiness. Mm. And I knew that this thing, there was a reason why. He did that and was placed there. I believe that. Now, don't get me wrong. That was not like from there on out, everything was great. I stumbled many times after that. But what I realized was that I was on a journey. I was on a journey and uh, I've been on it ever since. Patrick, why leadership? I remember I asked you that at dinner and you went pretty deep and I know that you had a lot of siblings, right? So can we go into all of the reasons why leadership is so important to you? personally? Yeah. Um, so I'm the youngest of 10. Um, my dad was a car salesman, right? And when we think of car salesman, we generally don't think favorably. We think, um, sneaky, right. Shifty. He was of the highest integrity Mm. and I always looked up to him and my company Emory leadership group is actually his middle name was Emory. So it's actually Mm -hmm. after him that I, I named that company. And, to me, leadership, uh, there's a quote by John Quincy Adams that says, if your actions inspire somebody to dream more, do more, learn more, or become more, you're, you're a leader. Yeah. Nothing in there about a title, because my dad got his GED in, as an adult. He got his GED. So it certainly wasn't education or title that was creating an environment for leadership. It was his actions and inspiration. And what's interesting is my dad was was an alcoholic for many years and when i got to high school he stopped completely never to drink again wow and i look at that as again an an action that was completely inspiring to me here was an an individual and and he wasn't somebody that was 
an outward, um, you know, belligerent or any of these sort of stereotypes for, for somebody that's, that drinks, it was all sort of behind the scenes, but I had so much admiration for him and respect that he, when he put his mind to something, he just, he did it. And that was one of those. And the fact that my mother didn't work until I was, uh, in junior high, he supported 10 kids, um, as an automobile salesperson. My goodness. Wow. Yeah. How do you, Which, how do you, so you and I talked, it was interesting because you were asking me a lot of questions about, you know, the younger generation and kids and bullying and, and that sort of thing. But how has your, not only leadership education, but your leadership experience translated to being the parent that you are today? Because I'm sure, again, I don't have children. Alan doesn't have children, but I'm sure right now is probably one of the more difficult times, <laughs> you know, to, to parent. So how do you, how do you focus on being the right leader for your children, depending on the, the situation? Yeah. Um, again, I go back to that definition of actions and inspiring by John Quincy Adams. And all I've done is, is, is replace actions with behaviors. It's all about behaviors. Leadership is, there's nothing else to it other than behaviors from, in my humble opinion, mm. that if I behave in certain ways, do I draw people to me or do I push them away? So for my kids, now my oldest son is 22 years old and I, I would consider him a best friend at this point. That said, I'm still his dad. Right. That there's, there's both sides of this. This isn't one of those where, um, Oh, I'll do whatever you want because I just hope that you'll be my friend and, and I'll look cool in front of all your friends. Hmm. It's a, it's a respect there, but it's based on behaviors. And I think one of the first behaviors that, that I address in terms of the workshops that I do, and again, to me, leadership or disengagement in an organization is no different than in somebody's home life. It's the same thing. So either in an organization, it might be disengagement, and in a marriage, it's divorce. Hmm. But the same behaviors either create a strong relationship or they erode the relationship. And the first one that I use is, is around congruence. So I have a model that I called cables mm. and cables is the, the whole idea behind this. It's a blueprint for six behaviors that create a bridge, a relationship bridge that we cross every day. I remember talking to you about this at dinner Can you go into cables and, and what each one is. Sure. Well, congruence is the first one. And, and with congruence is, is about integrity and walking the talk. And what I mean by that is that I've got a 15 year old daughter who we get along great that as she's driving, if we're driving down the highway and I'm driving the car and I'm on my phone checking my email, mm. how, how closely is she going to listen to me if I tell her you better be safe when you drive? Right, right. She's, she's going to say you're full of it. Yeah. You don't, you don't practice what you do. Or my oldest son, if I tell him to be responsible when he goes out drinking, if he sees me on a weekend – you know, putting back a 12 pack sitting around a fire pit or out on our boat again, they're going to look and say, you're, you're full of it. You don't, you don't do what you say you want other people to do. Mm -hmm. And if it was my wife, it's around, um, loyalty that I can't ask her to, to respect the vows that we've had for each other. If I don't do that myself, right. It doesn't work. So that's incongruence. That's the first one is, is around congruence. And incongruence, obviously, is when we don't, we don't walk the talk. The next one is around appreciation. And that's um, when we recognize each other for what we do. Mm. We don't do that enough. I call them RPMs. Just like in your, in your car, you've got a tachometer. Recognize positive moments. Those are our RPMs in life. Mm. Is that is that something that you find especially appreciation? Like, I think it's easier, maybe easier, quote unquote, in a relationship. But when it comes to like corporations and businesses, is that something that do you think that's been left behind, or is oh, that getting without, worse? Is it getting better? Without question, it's been left behind. And oftentimes, what happens is, is we have this mentality of, well, that's what they're getting paid for. Why should we have to tell them they're doing a good job too? Mm, right. That's the mentality. And that's not the way our brains operate. 
I don't care that I'm getting paid to do it. It's still nice to be recognized. Right. And those that really understand leadership, inspiring others, they understand how important appreciation is. And there's lots of research that backs it up now mm. that says that you, this clearly has an impact on favorable relationships right. when we um, use positive language toward each other and recognize each other. Right. And th here's where this has become a challenge, though, because you bring up a great point, especially within organizations, is this isn't about everybody gets a trophy. Right. Right? Because recognition has to happen in a way that people feel as though it's sincere. Mm. So it can't just be, you know, on Thursday somebody gets the gold star because nobody believes that's true. Right, they think it's just a manipulation tool. It has to be sincere, sincere yeah. appreciation for what somebody's doing or providing to you. So that's the A. When it comes to the A, do you have systems in your life to make sure with your kids, with your wife, with your company that you're make you know giving appreciation? <laughs> what you appreciate appreciates, right? It grows. So yeah, do you have systems in place for that? Yeah. Um, I would say on a general system from a, a system, this model called cables is something that if I'm having a difficult time with somebody else and we'll, I'll, as we go through each of them, what I challenge the people that I work with is to say, if you're having a difficult time with somebody else, you're part of the problem first. Mm. As easy it, or as nice as it might be for us to always say, well, it's not me, it's them. That's not the case. We own some of the responsibility for the problems that we're in. What you mean? It's not with Kevin's somebody fault. else. <laughs> it's not Kevin's fault, right? Yeah. Well, the, the only exactly the it's only, at least seventy percent. The only Kevin's thing fault. that has been in every single one of my relationships is me. So I, I have a feeling I'm I have something to, yeah. to do with it. Well, and and you'll see as we go through this cables that I I believe that we both have a responsibility in here. But for me. I need to own my stuff first. Right. Mm -hmm. So I go through this model and say, wait a minute, if I'm having problems right now, is there a chance right now that I haven't really been demonstrating a lot, enough appreciation for this person? Right. Or my behaviors haven't really demonstrated that I've been congruent. So that requires me to face the mirror at myself, which to me is the best leadership tool you can buy, mm. is a mirror. Right. That's fire. That's fire. Yeah, that is. That is. Yeah. All right. So what is the B? So the B, so the B is being for others mm, and okay. belongingness. And uh, for anybody that's listened to Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks about it in terms of the 51% rule. And to me, the B in this belongingness, we know how important it is for us to be connected with other people. And when we're for other people, there's a, there's a reciprocity that we receive from that. And 51%, I, I would agree with too, in terms of I'm just trying to provide a little bit more value than I get out of this relationship. If I go into every interaction trying to do that, trying to give a little bit more than I, I'm going to get from this, then we're always going to be in a place of, of people feeling appreciative mm -hmm. of what I'm bringing, right? And we can all think of that, right? You guys can think of people that, that have always been ones that have helped out other people when they needed something. And what happens when they need something? Everybody wants to try and help. Right? Yeah, you did that now, most recently, Patrick. Appreciate you with yeah, the LinkedIn and, thing for the event. I, I won't forget that. And if you ever need something, I'll be there for you. But and that's that's and that's not why we do it, right? I right. mean, that's the important thing is that we don't do it just to. But it's important, right? Because what it says is that I'm not just a taker, right? And how many of us have been around people that that we think like the only reason they do something for us is because we know an ask is coming? Oh yeah, yeah. So I was right? talking, there's a manipulation to it. I was talking to my girlfriend recently and I said the golden rule. Oh, she, Britt Franks is calling me back. I'm gonna, <laughs> Sorry, Britt. Sorry, Britt. Um, one of the speakers at our event. So I was talking <laughs> to my girlfriend recently and we were talking about the golden rule and I told her that I don't agree with it. And she immediately resonated. And here's why. I said, I don't aspire to treat others how I want to be treated. I aspire to treat them better. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing you just described. Yeah, and she felt that same way, too. And I also brought a quote to her. Givers need to set limits because takers have none. She's such a giver. I am too. And it's like, I think it's important to be a giver, but also to understand when you're in a relationship where it's not reciprocated. It's not sustainable. Bam. 
Right. Perfect. And and remember that because we'll talk about that in the S because no. oh. I think that's Perfect. so important. <laughs> um, so, so that's being for others to me and belongingness. And there's so much, again, I think the difference in the world that we're coming into now is these aren't just sort of feel good, fluffy type of things that there's actually research that will back up why these things are important now, whether organizationally or in a family setting or in a community setting, I don't care where you are. Mm. And to me, that's what I love about you know, a model like cables so that I don't have to be different in different places. If right. I behave in these ways, wherever I am, the relationship is going to be better. Right, right. The bridge is going to be stronger. Principles that apply everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the L to me is one of the most important part and that's listening. Mm. And to me, if, if there was one superpower that I think would, would change the world, it's listening. Really listening, though. And listening has four parts to it. The one is listening with the, with the ears, right? Tone of voice, the words somebody uses. But then there's listening with your eyes, and that's body language. What are people doing with their, with their, you know, their arms, their legs, their torso, their, their facial expressions? We can read so much in that when we're really listening to somebody and picking up on those things. The other two, one is listening with the mind, and that's listening in a sense of, Right? We can all be in situations where we think we know why somebody said something else or what they meant by it. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but oftentimes we pass judgment on that mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, huh, is this really what the person's trying to say or might they be trying to say something else? I take a moment to pause, to think about what else could this mean rather than just jump down the person's throat. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is listening with the heart. And that's around sort of empathic listening. And that really is about trying to listen from the standpoint of how would I want to be listened to if the, if the seats were changed here and this person was having the, or I was having the conversation with this person, how would I want them to listen to me? Patrick, I read a study a while ago. I don't have any of the stats because, you know, that's, that's just how I roll. But I read somewhere that you can have, I love that. <laughs> you can have your cell phone. If somebody's talking to you and you're in an intimate conversation, if you have your cell phone, it is X amount, like, you're not nearly as connected. Even if you take your right. cell phone and flip it over and put it on the table, the fact that the cell phone is there, that inhibits some form of connection in that conversation. And now everybody has phones on them at all times. How, yeah. is, how important is it to make it a priority to, to communicate and listen and make that your top priority. Like put the phones away and make sure you're actually listening and paying full attention to the person. Yeah. I, and that's why I would say it's a superpower because when, when you're in that place where you're able to do this and these are muscles, mm. think of it that way. Listening is a muscle, right? Right. So if you haven't been really good at it, right. You guys know if you're dealing with somebody that hasn't been to the gym and you're bringing them in there for the first week, Right you need to understand that that's where they are right. and they need to grow from that. Right. But we all have this ability to do that. But I would certainly, the, the having the phone in your pocket or, or wherever it is, I certainly think it's a distraction. Mm. So it's, it's making an effort. And look, we don't do that for everybody. It depends on the conversation you're in. But if this is a, if this is an important, serious conversation, then the more, focused you can be on really listening on all four of those fronts. So I would call it four wheel listening, mm. just like in your vehicle, right? If you get all wheel drive, it's a better vehicle to be in from a stability standpoint in rough, in rough terrain. Oh yeah. So it's four wheel listening. So the, one of them is listening with your mind and it's questioning the conclusions you're drawing in real time. Yeah. If I'm correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Because we could sit there and think, oh, I heard what they just said, and I immediately interpret how, what, what they mean by that. Right. As opposed to saying, maybe, maybe that isn't what they meant. Maybe I should ask them. Yeah. You know what, Alan, what you just said, here's what I'm thinking that meant. Is that really what you meant to say? Wow. As opposed to, I walk away pissed off thinking that, you know, you were disrespectful in terms of what you were saying to me. Hmm. I think that's the one I need to work on most out of the four. And just listening. Not dr yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> right. Hey, that, that too. Well, I do talk for a living, so. <laughs> what, do we, what do we have is, for an E? <laughs> is there a T in there empathy. for talking, Patrick? <laughs> it's empathy, and Alan, I can feel for you right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Seventy percent is his fault. <laughs> yeah. So what is from, it's empathy from from your Just, standpoint and, and a good example and a good definition to the listeners? What is empathy? What's a good example of empathy? Yeah. Uh, you know what's funny is I was reading a book the other day by Hal Elrod, and um, it's his book was the Miracle Morning, I think. Ooh. And what was interesting is as he was talking about this book and the success that he's had and where he is today, and he said he has to catch himself at times when he walks down the street. And he sees somebody that might be asking for money or, you know, just doing some stuff that's, that's really uh, unacceptable in most norms. And before he judges this person, he, he tries to come to the conclusion of, I have no idea what this person had, had to deal with growing up, right. what their story is, what their backstory is. And for all I know, that if I lived the life they led, I could be worse than they are. Right. Yeah, that's that's powerful. But what do we do? And and look at I'm guilty of this too, right? I will pass judgment on somebody else without really thinking, boy, I wonder I wonder what it's like to be in their shoes. Right. Yeah. Right. You right. Would I be all high and mighty if for all I know, they had a whole family and, and all of them died in a car crash and they were the only one that survived? Right. Well, I'd probably lose my mind at that point too. Right. Yeah. And even if it's situational, like if somebody cuts you off in traffic and this yeah. is, I've been, I've been trying so hard at this. My initial reaction is to say like, huh, I'm going to track you down and I'm yeah. going to find you. <laughs> but, but then I have to say like, what if they're late or what if they weren't paying attention or what if, right. you know, what if their mind was wandering? Like it's, they, I guarantee they didn't cut, think like this kid looks really nice. I'm going to cut him off and wreck his day. Right. And it's a, right. con it's a conscious thing. Like, like all of this is, this is all conscious. Without question. So, I mean, and that really is the, the scientific term for that is called attribution error. That what we do is we label when things don't do, when they don't do the right thing, we blame it on their lack of ability to do it. Hmm. Whereas when we don't do the right thing, it was somebody else's fault or the system didn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't that we're broken. It, See, we got to switch those. The system That's was leadership broken. Is switching those, right? So when yeah. we do something wrong, it is our fault. Take ownership and shift. Oh, totally. It. And then when it's because that's the interesting thing. How many times have you cut somebody off on accident? Exactly. Never. Never. Totally. <laughs> no, no. We, yeah. Right. <laughs> Pat, no, Patrick, right. we need from, the mirror. From Kevin. a scientific <laughs> standpoint, why? Why are we? Do you know the science behind why we're actually wired that way to? avoid that feedback or do you have any, any oh god i don't i mean a lot of these things they're called unconscious biases right and they're unconscious because most of the time we would deny that we actually do these things right. that's why they're unconscious right a lot of them go back to um negative storytelling really and if you think about it it's that the reason our defaults oftentimes are to think about the negative is because that's why we're here today yeah is because yeah, survival. We couldn't look at a, a saber tooth tiger and think, boy, that the cub is awfully cute. I think I'll go over to it. You had to immediately be thinking like, this is a problem. Right, I'm in right. danger right now. What What's the harm that's going to happen here before you thought of the good stuff? And I think it's a system that the reptilian part of our brain that continues to act in ways that we don't need it today. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you're enjoying this episode. We just wanted to give you a friendly reminder of Top Notch Live, January 25th in Lowell, Massachusetts. If you go to www.topnotchlive2020.com, we are going to have you in that room creating a clear 2020 vision of your future. Mm, yes. Uh, see what I did there? I see what you did Eight there. speakers, two Q&A panels, one hour and a half for lunch to network going to be fire. Everybody says that 2020 is going to be their best year yet. It is only going to be as good as you make it. Help us help you make it the best year yet. Talk to you soon. Bye. Mm. Okay. We did an episode on insecurities yesterday? Was that yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. Yeah, and we talked about how most of the insecurities that people have, we, we literally whiteboarded all my insecurities, all Kevin's past, present, and uh, I guess not future, but past and present. And in the upper right hand corner, we put like a star and put all of these are based on a fear of judgment because we're fear of being ostracized from the from the yeah. group. And I from think the group. that's that reptilian brain as well, because back in the day, evolutionarily, if you weren't part of the tribe, you didn't potentially eat that night. And so if you were different, it was a bad thing, even though now it's content consistently like a good thing yeah. if you're different. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I would say probably you were lucky if it was just you didn't eat for the night and you weren't killed. Right. 
yeah. in terms of being voted outside of the group. You needed that group for survival. And that, to me, is back to the be on belongingness, that I think today we have the same thing that happens. And I know, um, Kevin, I know you and I had this conversation as it relates to things around suicide and depression and, yes. and well-being, that I think today when people are ostracized or pushed outside of a group and don't feel belonging, they die a different death. Mm. Might not be the saber-toothed tiger that eats them because they didn't have the protection of the tribe, but they die anyway. Right. When you say that, what you mean a part of them dies, like the, yeah. the level of fulfillment or what are, you, yeah. what are you referring to exactly? Yeah, because we need connection. And when you don't have that, you we just sort of, we deteriorate. And that's not the same thing as enjoying being alone. Right. This is about loneliness and and not feeling as though you have anybody to connect with. Mm. You don't have a choice in it. You don't have anybody to connect with. That is different than I'm choosing to have some awesome. some time to recharge my jets. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great Not point. the same thing. Right. What is the, so we, we have an S. We have to do the S, right? We have so boom, S yeah. So the, S, so the S is around specifics, and that's about clear expectations. And when I do this work in terms of relationships, the first five people might think, oh, it seems kind of fluffy. I'm going to be taken advantage of, right? I'm going to be a better listener and appreciate other people and be for them. Well, the S is around setting guidelines. What do we need from each other? Clear expectations. And if there's one area relationship-wise that I see things go off the rail the fastest is when we don't really have clear expectations of what we need. What's a good relationship? What do you need for me to feel fulfilled in this relationship? Or us as a couple, what do we need to be fulfilled? Right. What do we need from each other? That if we have clear understanding of what that is, the specifics, then then it's just up to us to deliver on those things. And that's where I said, now that I get to the end of cables, I would sit there and say, is it me? If, have I not been clear enough in my expectations? Before I blame an employee for not following through on a job, and I just left an appointment that we talked about this because they're having problems with one of their directors, we said, well, does the person really know what's expected of them? Right, right. How do you hit a target now, you don't know exists? You're right. Now, the other part of that is we could have a clear target but if I don't hold you accountable to having either hit it or not hit it, then I'm to blame as well, right? I can set the expectation. But then if, if you don't hit it and I'm like, oh, I don't want to deal with this right now. I don't want to talk to Kevin about this right now. Then all I've done is I've reinforced to you that what we set for a clear expectation really isn't that important. Right. Mm -hmm. When it comes and you to, don't have to follow through on it. When it comes to intimate relationships, so I was we were at a mastermind this morning. And we were talking openly. So my girlfriend and I have some systems in place. We have a check-in every Sunday. We go through our needs. We also have, like, I have a flashcard in my pocket of the five cup fillers. Basically, I want to understand specifically what matters to her most so that my efforts are what matters to her most. That's pretty self-explanatory. Do you have systems? So you use this in every area of your life. Do you have a I system do. in place in your intimate relationship to make sure you two are clear on what matters to each other consistently as that evolves? <laughs> well, it's funny. So we're coming on 20 years now that uh, my wife and I have been, uh, we've been together. And uh, I think it's one of those that, to me, we're together somewhat of a muscle, right? That we we understand each other. I know, I know what those things are, but that doesn't allow me to take for granted that I still need to listen at a very basic level. And I know when we're going off the rail, when she and I aren't getting along, because um, there's just a, there's a, a tension to it. Right. And the worst thing that I can do is look at cables and think, which, which isn't she doing? Right. 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 And because that's the easiest thing to do, right? We want to blame somebody else or say, oh, it's not me, it's you. But if I come to this and then I go into this relationship saying, you know what, um, I realize over the past week, I really haven't done a very good job of listening to you or being or being um, respectful of of how much is on your plate. Right. But when I do that, I know that we're going to be in a better place because she knows that I, I care. I've demonstrated it. Right. It's the same thing with my kids or a friend of mine, whatever it might be. If I look to that first and say, I own something on this list, at least one thing I, I'm, I'm not doing that's creating this. So, so for me, it could, be, it could be that I don't think that I gave her a clear understanding of 
what I need out of this, what I'm looking for. So I want to blame her for not, for not delivering. But in reality, I wasn't very clear in terms of how important this was to me. Right. So your level of ownership is very high. So there's always a point in the, the podcast where I go from like, I always like to go dark for, for a little <laughs> bit, right? Just because obviously you come off as very confident. You're, you're extremely intelligent. You have so much knowledge. And we were just talking about insecurities. What, <laughs> what are some, if any, insecurities that you've had that you've had to overcome in order to be the man you are today. Just because when we talk about extreme ownership, that's something that Alan and I always talk about. I, I don't want it to be my fault in my relationship, but I will take ownership for everything that I possibly can because if I don't take ownership for it, I can't change it. But you have yeah. to be secure with yourself in order to do that. So what are some insecurities that you may have had at a younger age that you had to overcome to become the man as, that you are yeah. today? Um, so for many years... I was the person that didn't take accountability for any of my stuff. It was always somebody else's fault. Mm. I blamed somebody else. It was always an excuse for why things didn't work out the way they should have. But it was never mine. Mm. And I came upon that. I don't know. I, I probably was, was in my late 20s, I bet, that, that I started that realization. And uh, then I, I probably flipped the other way, that I took responsibility for everything. Right. And, and that was a negative too. Right. You found the middle eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> if any, if you've ever done, um, personalities, um, like a disc. So in, in disc, I'm what's considered, um, an eye, which eyes are, are very in tune to, I don't like to disappoint people. Mm. <laughs> so think about that from a standpoint of trying to hold people accountable right. when you're afraid that you're going to alienate somebody that is that's been one of the most difficult things that I've had to to work on and remind myself constantly of of coming from a place of if I'm if I'm going to have those conversations that they come from a place of concern mm. that I have an obligation to have these conversations as uncomfortable as they might be and they are god like I don't I don't like to um, disappoint people I don't like to do it. So how do you, but I know that that I have to work through that. Right. How do you have that? How do you have that conversation? How did you hone that, that skill? You know what? It's like a muscle. It is, it clearly is like a muscle in terms of, and I, I read a lot in terms of different people's perspectives. And one of the ones that I, I, um, leverage quite a bit is one by a woman named Kim Scott. She wrote a book called radical candor. Hmm. And it was a, just this very basic model of looking at a two-dimensional way of how you hold people accountable. And it was on the, you know, going top to bottom, it would be caring more. How much do you care about this person? And the more you care, the more you have a responsibility. To be honest. Yeah. To be honest. And that's what I have to remind myself constantly. Because the selfish thing to do is to say, well, it's, I don't want to have this conversation. Right. I try and protect myself. Right. What if you go at it? So I think the the main problem, and I've had this in the past, where I didn't start the relationship being that transparent. So when it came time to actually speak my truth, I never set the precedent. Where now mm. I'm in this relationship where nothing is off. Like, tell me how you feel. Did How did I make you feel? Did I screw that up? Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who they feel like they're ready to take this next step in their relationship. So let's do two sides. One, they're already in this relationship and now they have to figure out how to be that transparent and how to have that authentic, honest communication. And then how do you get into a relationship if you haven't been with a new person and make that the precedent from the beginning? Tough question. Um, So the, the first one, I think you, you have conversations around being uncomfortable about it Mm -hmm. is, is sort of basic as that sound. I might say, you know what? This is not easy for me. This conversation is not easy. And I will tell you why it's not easy because I'm a person that I don't like to disappoint people. And I feel like what I want to talk to you about is it might do that. Right. I would be that upfront about it because I put my vulnerability out there to say, this is uncomfortable for me. You know, I've been, I've been thinking about how to approach you on this for two days. Mm. And I know that 
I care enough about a relationship that um, I, I need to be able to do this. Mm. So that's the first approach. I think you take small, you take small sort of steps toward it too, right? You're not going to change 180, but how can you maybe do one thing differently? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and along those lines, because I could have people will say, oh, cables, boy, that there's set, you know, there, there are six different things to, to think about there. And I would say, I would agree. And to me, if we're going to do this just like in a one day workshop or a half day workshop and talk about these, you won't do any of them because this is like drinking through a fire hose right now. Yeah. That what I would ask you to do is, is maybe, um, there are to do's and to be's and to do's are our checklists, right? It's, I've got to do my, you know, whatever I've got to go work out. I've got to put in this much reading today in terms of the work that I'm doing. I've got to write this article. Those are my to do's to be's are about who am I going to be today? Right. How can I be a better listener today? How can I focus on being more congruent today? And that's it. I'm not going to do anything else today, but focus on, um, maybe it's clear expectations today. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be aware of, of, the conversations that I have and, and how clear I am in regards to expectations. Patrick, the reason the to be's just for clarity for the listeners and for myself as well, it's if let's say you did that for a day and you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on being congruent <clears> today. <throat> that becomes an unconscious competency and that becomes more natural after that day. Yeah. Like, what's the thinking behind that? Yeah. Well, and the whole thing is because you bring it to the forefront, right? right. This is what I'm going to do. It, and I will even recommend that people put it in your calendar. You know, we all have phones with us that you could put on your calendar at 11 o'clock and all you have to say in there is listening. And my phone goes off at 11 o'clock and all it shows is listening. And all that is for me is a reminder to say, am I doing what I, what I put out to do today to try and be a better listener? Do you have a So journaling... maybe I do it at 11 o'clock? Oh, sorry. What's I, that? I was going to say, do you have a journaling habit that checks in? I was talking to Kevin yesterday and... Um... The question I've started asking myself before bed as of last night <laughs> is, did I maximize my potential today and rate it zero to 10? Because what he was saying is like what we were saying, but his idea was basically like, you're not just because you're the most productive out of maybe some of your associations, that doesn't mean that you're maximizing your potential. So it's yeah. like, do you have <clears throat> a journaling habit that checks in with these things? So my journaling is all in the morning. Um, I, I journal every morning. And I start out by writing the, the three things that I'm grateful for. Mm. And I will mix them up every morning, three different things. And then I go into basically, um, what am I going to attract today? What will I manifest and attract into my life today? And how will that impact other people? Cool. That's, that's sort of how I, I, I focus that. And then also I, I do a standard piece that I pulled from uh, Napoleon Hill that I read every single morning. Um, on a definite chief aim. So that's my ritual in the morning. I, I, it seems like, all right, you and I talked about this in our interview, and this is something I love to talk about with other men. You already said the word vulnerability. That's, that's a buzzword now for a lot of people. <laughs> it's, it's big, right? But I, and you and I talked about this, like a lot of men get backed into the corner of not, and, and this is in quotes for those who can't see it, not being able to be vulnerable, not, being able to have emotions or feelings. What do you say to those men out there? Say there's a man listening to this right now who was raised his entire life to like, you know, rub some dirt in it, stop crying, like get over it. Don't be a pansy, yeah. whatever. How do you start breaking down the walls and realize that being vulnerable is actually a good thing? You're actually going to be more connected to the people in your life. How, what are the initial steps to open up and be vulnerable? Yeah, we had this conversation, right? And I think men, have been, have been duped, right. About what it, what it means to be tough and, and rugged and, and right. masculine. And I played all of those things. I mean, I, I, through college, I bounced at a bar. I did mixed martial arts. I write all the tough guy things. And, and I was probably the weakest right. <laughs> as an individual. Right. And from a standpoint of vulnerability, I think we need to take it a step further. That vulnerability is, is your ultimate strength. And I talk about it in terms of intentional vulnerability, that we need to make ourselves intentionally vulnerable. That's not just, you know, I, I'm going to be vulnerable. It's like I'm looking for ways that I can say I'm sorry, I was wrong, um, I'm scared, 
I don't know the answer. From a leadership perspective, that's the stuff that inspires me. Now, that said, do I want to follow somebody that every day they say, right. scared again, don't know where we're going, um, <laughs> right? Yeah, no. You got to balance it. <laughs> no. Yeah. But I, but I do want to know that that is in that person's wheelhouse to be able to do that, to be able to demonstrate that comfortably. And to me, that is like... When you can be vulnerable, and I don't care what anybody thinks of me if I'm crying in front of the group, that is like, that's the most power that you can provide because it's like, I, this is this is who I am. Right. And I think if more people took the masks off and were more transparent, we'd be in a better place. You talk about connection, and that's kind of why cables is such a cool acronym because it's a connection of a cable. And <clears throat> I think you mentioned this at dinner, but maybe not. Um a cable's made of more than just one wire. It's like intertwined wires, which is cool. But anyway, so if you're not living in the truth, is that something that you said? Or did I just kind of... Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, that's the whole image on this. And I use right. the Golden Gate Bridge as, as, my, as the image that I use on this because the Golden Gate Bridge, even though it's one three-foot cable, it's really, I think it's 27,000 individually wrapped cables. Right. And... The point on that is that I could cut a hundred of those cables on the bridge and nothing is going to happen to that because it has enough cables to hold it up. Right. And it's the same thing with our relationships that if we, if we demonstrate these cables, these behaviors, each of these six over a period of time, we build a stronger and stronger relationship bridge so that when things go bad, which they will, I will do the wrong thing. I will... Um, I will disappoint you. I will be selfish at times, but I've acted in a positive way long enough that this is repairable. Right. My goodness. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because in my I'm like, did I just connect that in my head? I'm always trying, I'm trying to be really careful about what stories I tell myself. <laughs> but so, living in the truth, transparency, vulnerability, like that—that that I think is the key to staying connected to yourself and connected to others. Why do you believe most people are telling themselves a story that's not true, whether that's the ego? Because lack of vulnerability is basically putting on a front, like a facade, right? I mean, why, yeah. do, you think that's, why do you think that's a thing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't have the answer to that, but I would say ego is certainly part of it. I think we live in a world right now, too, from a social media standpoint, right? And Kevin, I know you and I had this conversation. If you look at youth, I think between... 10 and and was it 24 that the the suicide rate has tripled yeah it's something like that i think it's in isn't it higher in in women as well yeah and i don't i don't know i didn't see the breakout of of that but i i just think that we we put on so many fronts whether it's instagram or facebook and we take a picture six times and we you know and we we compare ourselves to other people too much. Like I'm not doing enough. And I'm, again, I'm guilty. I listen to somebody else's podcast. And I'll be like, damn, right. that was good. Mine's not that good. <laughs> well, that video is really good. And I need to, I need to reel it back in to think that's their stuff. That's not my stuff. Yeah. You can learn from it and it can yeah. drive you to improve, but exactly. you don't want it to be a reflection of Bingo. your own, Right, your own insecurity because they're they're right. at a different your own leg self in their worth. journey. Your own self worth, exactly. Right. Yes. So I just pulled it up, Patrick, just so we know. In 2017, there were 47 percent more suicides among people aged 15 to 19 than in the year 2000. Yeah. So that yeah, that is a lot. That's it's yeah, Crazy. There, There's a lot of that. There is a lot of that going on, and I don't. Uh, do you? I think. Go ahead. I think belongingness. Right. I think belongingness plays in there again. Right. That. And especially men, I don't think we, my wife has very close friends. Fortunately, I do as well. But my wife talks about many of her female friends that their husbands don't have a close group of men that they can talk to. Right. And I think that is really important. Right. How do you find that? I've been lucky. I, I mean, two of them are, they're two that I grew up with where they're like brothers to me. Right. And you talk about all of the truth, like the thing. Yeah. Like, there's no facade. I was telling Kevin yeah. back no, before I no, really knew I shouldn't. Him. Go ahead. Sorry. There's probably, on some level, there are probably things at times that don't come out as easy. So don't don't get me wrong. Like this is, we just, you know, we just air it all out there. There still is at times some, some of that ego creeps in. Right. 
I don't want to go there. But overall, I know that I can, I can have a real conversation with these guys and not worry that they're going to be like, <laughs> really? Right. One of the shifts that I had to make early on when I started really chasing my dreams and, and living in my truth was instead of trying to impress everybody, just try to express your truth, like express yourself. Yeah. And I think with guys, it's harder <clears throat> because we're all just trying to impress each other. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's really, it can, it can really get the best of you. Um, but we're fortunate that we can talk about I, these things. Uh, when Patrick and I were talking, I said, I think that the biggest, the biggest deciding factor on how close your friendship will be on, is on your ability to be vulnerable. Right. The more vulnerable you are able to be, the better friends you will be. And the people that you can't be vulnerable with, you can't be real with, so you're you're not going to have a great friendship. And yeah, because it's, it, it, to me, it's like any relationship at that point, right? Because it's it's not really a choice. You're not, you, you're not giving everything you can because you're afraid that you're going to say something and maybe they're going to be like, oh, really? Right. That's, I didn't realize that was, you're, you're out. And who do you go to when you need to talk about, like, you, like Alan and I can talk about anything, right? Right. There's there's yeah. been times where it's like I don't know who else to talk to, and my girlfriend I could talk to. I talk, I had a difficult conversation with her about something today, and it's like if you don't have those people, we where you don't have that. Like there's nobody I can be this vulnerable with. Then yeah. what are you supposed to do? That's why therapy is so important because you can talk to them, right? Yeah, but totally. Yeah. All right, Patrick, we're coming to, we're coming up against the clock here. The t- this went by unreasonably fast. Yeah, it did. We went, we went deep. But Alan and I have two questions that we like to ask every person that's on the podcast. And then I want to make sure we give you some time to plug anything and everything you have going on. So I'll let Alan ask his question first. Ah. Alan first. I like I know better than I... to let you go last. Yeah, because then I'll take 10, 15 minutes for one question. No, I'm kidding. All right, Patrick. <laughs> so <laughs> He's not kidding. I, yeah, right? <laughs> so I don't know if you noticed this at dinner or not, but I, I wear a necklace slash chain around my neck. It's a true north. I probably told you about it. But I often say the following quote, you cannot see the stars during the day. They are always there. But sometimes it takes the darkness to see clearly that which we simply could not within the light. So my true north is my guide. It's constant. It's unwavering. It never changes. So I think we grow and evolve and change. And obviously you have. Um, since you're in, so into personal development from 18 until now. But what about you through all of these years of personal development and growth never changed? Wow, what has never changed? I, I would say a belief in myself that even in my my darkest moments, when I was when I was doing some some pretty bad stuff, Internally, I knew that wasn't who I was. Right. I knew who that that wasn't who I was. Incongruence. I was just thinking that. Incongruence, and that'll erode your self esteem too. Yeah. My question, I again, we we have to go, See, but like this is what happens, Patrick. What, this is why you got to keep how, it on the rails. <laughs> how do you know when you're living incongruently? Like it, it's like because I, I did that too. What you just described is like exactly how I've felt at times when I was, you know, drinking. And it's like, I kind of knew that I was a tourist and that I would never really move in, but yet I knew I was better than that. I knew I wasn't maximizing my potential. So how did you find that, that out? I I don't know other than to say that I just knew that this, I wasn't going to allow this to define where I was going to go. I was better than the things that I was doing, right. not in that moment, but I just, I knew that there was a, there was going to be an out. There was, I was going to learn from this and grow. And I will tell you as a, as a coach and as someone that, that works in this space, I think that's my, my strength at this point is that I've lived on the low side of things. And in regards to cables, I've broken every one of those behaviors that I talk about. And I've, I've felt the effects of them right. when I'm not living those. Mm. Yeah. You've been in the dark of not doing those. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's fire. Appreciate you sharing that. I'm going to ask yeah. my question now. Oh, I think it's time. Okay, yeah. I'll ask do my you, question. Do you want yeah. to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll ask it. All right. So I think, I think the greatest thing that ever happened to me was finding out what I wanted to accomplish before I die. Like what is the legacy I want to leave behind? What is the impact that I want to have? What do I want? people to say when i'm gone what do you hope to accomplish with your time on this planet what do you want to accomplish before you die patrick what do i want to accomplish before i die um 
I, I think first and foremost for my kids that I leave a legacy that, that they can say that I walked the talk, that I was a good role model for them in terms of helping them live their lives, a life they wanted to live on their own, not a life that I held them to, mm. that I gave them that space from a, you know, from a, from a family standpoint, certainly a wife that I, I want to leave her feeling as though, um, I was always there that I was somebody that was a best friend for her. Mm. And then I would say globally, it's, it would be to have people really take a deep look into behaviors are the key to this. It's it. We've overcomplicated so many different components to leadership and what it takes. It's just about behaviors. Mm. That's it. If we just behave in ways that inspire other people, that's all we need to do. Yeah, I love it. I remember hearing a quote once, and then we'll go. No, no, we got to let Patrick plug his things. That's right. That's true. How dare you? How dare I heard you? a quote once where knowledge might have been the difference maker in the 20th century, but in the 21st century with Google and all of that, it's conduct, which is behavior. How you behave is the biggest difference. So that's fine. Totally. Speaking been, of behavior, yeah. 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 where can the totally. listeners <laughs> learn more about <laughs> you? And um, so, Patrick, I'm genuinely blown away by this. This was definitely one of my favorites in terms of I don't feel like there's any question that we could a ask you that we wouldn't get a quality answer to right like you just hammered it so where can people learn more about you where Thanks. can they find your podcast website where can they hire you all of those things um so instagram uh coach patrick v uh, twitter's the same thing at coach patrick v uh, my website um, which may change um to soon but we'll keep that under wraps for now is uh emory leadership group.com and that's e-m-e-r-y leadership group.com um, are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. And then my podcast is Lead Like No Other. And it is a great podcast. I mean, you had, you know you had two great guests on. We're sitting right here. So well, I know how at, bad could it be? The, the last a... <laughs> the last episodes have been great. Yeah, you had at least one really great guest. <laughs> yes, this one. Yeah, <laughs> Patrick, if you could leave the listeners with only one ten second thing to motivate, inspire, break something loose, inform, whatever, what would it be? Ten second blip. Don't chase other people. Find ways to rise above your best. Mm, fire. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick V is a great man. He walks his talk. It is a great podcast as well. I've been listening to that. And I genuinely mean this, Patrick. You are a great man. And we are very, very grateful that you uh, set this time aside to, to chat with us today. It was, it was a great talk. You guys are awesome. Thanks. Thank and uh, Alan, I will tell you, um, my water intake has increased. Ooh. Yeah. All right. One of the five pillars. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, you are so very welcome. Thank you for that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Talk soon. Thanks, man.